you mentioned you were uh, sort of a almost high school dropout. Uh, you've, you now speak at high schools sometimes, speak to music programs, speak to jazz groups. What, what do you say to young musicians? How do you inspire them to, to, to stick with it? And, and especially jazz, which I think you've even said publicly that there's a sense that society is almost hostile to cutting edge jazz. Well, my basic feeling that I, I would try to communicate to anyone who's interested in, in music is that the intrinsic value of music is something that is so worthwhile. And, and, and it's like this bank that if you put X number of hours of study, listening, um, work, practice, whatever, into this bank, you will get, you know, many, many multiple hours back from that effort. And it makes it something very unique. Now, you know, people talk all the time like, wow, what's going to happen with music? You know, downloading and, you know, the culture is hostile towards mm. a certain kind of creativity. You know, we have American Idol, which is amateur musicians, you know, playing bad music singing out of tune and all this kind of stuff and um, you know most people not only don't know who Miles Davis is they don't know who Mozart is you know now my feeling is that I would communicate to young musicians who are concerned about that is don't worry about it too much because music sort of exists with a um, you know a currency that is so um, sort of robust that nothing can really do anything to it. It's, it's like good notes are good notes. Mm -hmm. And good notes sort of transcend everything else. me it's like I've been lucky I've had a really great life as a musician but the best part of my life as a musician is that when I hear a B flat and then I hear an F my brain explodes <laughs> with just like a, a million things that that means or that it can mean or that it might mean or that it, it that connect that interval to nature, to the universe, to the world, to the people around me, to the people I love, to the people I don't know. I mean, music becomes this sort of all-encompassing thing that has its own value, that is absolutely separate from the culture that forms it. And that, to me, is something that it's hard to, to overemphasize that to a young person, that the time they're spending working on something is absolutely worth it. But probably some of those parents of, of the kids you're talking to are saying, listen, be an accountant, be a lawyer, you know, do something practical because 0.0001% of the folks out there become Pat Metheny and make a living and a good living doing this. Um, do you encourage people to look at music not just as a, a passion but as a career? I think that there is a certain percentage of musicians that have no choice and I would be in that percentage. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have made any difference to me whether I became this amount of successful or this amount of successful. I would still practice 10 hours a day and I would still want to know why this chord wants to move to that chord rather than this chord under these conditions. I mean, I don't really have anything to, to say about it. Most of the musicians that I hang out with and that I play with are the same. It's not really an option. And, um, you know, to somebody who it is an option, like if somebody says, you know, I'm thinking about being a musician, I go, if you're thinking about it, don't do it. If you have to think about it, skip it. You know, for, for people who are like kind of the real deal, it's not a choice. It, is it a, a some, some musicians describe playing music and listening to music as a spiritual experience uh, for some people have perhaps even 
It's a plant's religion. It is their religion. It is, and there is sort of a spiritual quality to the, to your music. Um, I know some people have described it that way. For you, is is there a spiritual element to to playing music? I envy people who have the luxury of standing outside of music and making an observation like that. For me, music is, in the best sense, all-encompassing to me. By that, you know, I know musicians that, like, they see a beautiful sunset and then they go write a tune, or they have this happen or that happen, and then that inspires them to do this. For me, if I hear this note and I hear that note, that's enough for me. It's sort of like within the syntax of that musical exchange, there's a whole universe of potential there. And that's way more than enough for me. So I often have the experience myself of listening to music that I've made outside of the context that I live in it, you know. And, and I, I even have the thing of like, you know, I make a record and I put it in the car and I'm driving around and there's a sunset and I go, wow, this really fits with the sunset. But it's rare. It's mostly for me about like, okay, you know, this is gig number, you know, 75. And last night when it was on that, you know, E flat minor 7 flat 5, I played an F natural. Did I like that natural 9 or should I play, maybe I should try the flat 9 tonight. <laughs> I mean, there's all those kinds of, of, sort, of um, sort of issues of dialect. But then there's this whole other aspect of it that is, in fact, the exchange that happens with an audience, the kind of connection that I have as a musician to what's happening in the moment that sort of just, like, wipes everything else off the table. Those of you in the Toronto area can catch Pat Metheny and his rather unique orchestrion in Massey Hall on May the 13th. For more on Metheny, you can visit his website, patmetheny.com. Up next, Elvis lives in the form of Morris Bates, the world's greatest Elvis impersonator. <laughs> 